and welcome back to the Chronicles of Aguna preview show brought to you by loserpool.com. I'm your host, Harry Simeu, and on this week's show, we will be looking back at the victory over Cardiff City on Tuesday night, talking a little bit about the loan signing of Denis Suarez from Barcelona, and seeing as it is the preview show, we'll be looking ahead to our trip up to the Etihad to face Manchester City this Sunday. My guests this week are Arsenal author slash writer John Sperling and Manchester City Football Club's official vlogger and podcaster Ian Cheeseman. Let's begin with the narrow victory over Cardiff City at the Emirates Stadium on Tuesday night. Far from the most convincing of performances, it's got to be said. The weather was shit, the crowd was shit. And to be honest, the team's performance was shit for the most part as well. Um, Unai Emery lined up uh, with a bit of a, a surprise selection, in my eyes anyway. Um, he started off with Bernd Leno in goal, as you'd expect. The back four of Lichtsteiner, Mustafi, Monreal and Kolasinac. Mohamed Elneny sat just in front of them with Lucas Torreira and Matteo Guendouzi. And then there was kind of a trio uh, a little bit further up the pitch with Mesa Ozil, Pierre-Emerick Aubameyang and Alexander Lacazette. The subs bench on the evening was Petr Cech in goal, Aaron Ramsey, Iwobi Jenkinson, Mavropanos, Shaka, and Eddie Nketiah. Now, the issue I took with that team selection was it just looked a little bit negative to me. Um, I don't understand why you need to play with three defensive midfielders at home against Cardiff. You know, with all due respect, they're not going to cause you too many problems. Well, they shouldn't anyway. And it's a game that you should have the lion's share of possession in and you should be looking to start on the front foot and go on and win. And it just surprised me, to be honest. And I felt like the ball retention in the middle of the park in that first period just wasn't good enough. Um, you know, a lot of people have been talking about how great Gwen Doozy was. I didn't really see it, if I'm being honest with you. Mohamed Onneni is an average Joe, in my opinion. Dropped nicely in between the centre-backs from time to time to pick up the ball. But from then on, doesn't do much else, um, you know, other than play those sideways, simple passes. Lucas Torreira, for me, has lost his way a little bit in an Arsenal shirt of late. And, and the reason for that is, I don't know, it, to be honest. Is it because Unai Emery is asking him to press further up the pitch or... Or what is it? I'm just not sure. I think he's lost his way a little bit um, in the past couple of months or so, which is a shame. Um, there's definitely a great player in there somewhere and I'm sure he'll rediscover his form. But for me, that midfield trio just didn't work at all. I think we can all agree that Cardiff City probably carried more threat than Arsenal in the first half. Um, they had a penalty appeal waved away, probably was a penalty, having watched it back again. Um, but equally, Alexander Lacazette probably could have had two penalties in that first half um, and none of them were given. The referee, I think it was Mike Dean on the night, was not interested. He didn't want to know. Um, and that was really frustrating at halftime because even when you don't play well, you know, those kind of moments that can turn a game and and you know get you set you on your way towards victory can be so frustrating when it's a clear cut decision it's obvious isn't it it's a clear and obvious error um i think that's the phrase that the officials like to use these days but there is no var at the moment and there's no chance of a referee ever going back on his own decision in those circumstances and you know that really frustrated me at half time but i don't know you know the performance didn't warrant us being ahead at half time. So I kind of, whilst I was angry on the one hand at the fact that we didn't get the penalties, on the other hand, I was probably thinking to myself, you know, well, in actual fact, we don't deserve to be winning this game. So, you know, let's come out in the second half and, and perform a lot better. And credit where it's due, you know, you've got to say the players and uh, Unai Emery picked it up in the second half I don't know what he said to them at half time but he, I'm sure he wouldn't have been happy with what he'd seen in that opening 45 minutes he sent the players back out and there was a little bit more urgency to our game wasn't there more zip, more purpose um, but even still it didn't quite click um, you know we've spoken a lot in the recent months about how important our wing backs are how important said Kalasinac has been in that final third and it was him that broke through I think it was from an Alex Iwobi pass uh, Alex Iwobi who replaced Mohamed on Nenny um, you know he put Kalasinac in he, he managed to get a toe to the ball uh, before the defender and he went down uh, and won us a penalty and, and that penalty 
uh, was converted by Pierre Emerick Aubameyang. And then what happens in those scenarios is, you know, a team like Cardiff who have come there have tried to attack when they've had the opportunity on the counter attack, but for the most part have tried to sit deep and absorb, uh, now have to come out and, and start chasing the game. And, and that's when things started to open up for us. And then obviously the second goal was a superb individual effort from Alexander Lacazette. He picked the ball up right on the touchline, drifted inside, made space for himself, fired a shot and uh, Etheridge in the Cardiff goal couldn't keep it out. Um, you know, 2-0 and you, you feel as though Arsenal are home and dry. Um, I said that I didn't see what was so great about Matteo Guendouzi's performance in the first half. He was much improved in the second. I've got to say that um, it's only fair. So, you know, a, a lot of players pick things up, uh, sorry, pick their performances up in that second half. Carl Jenkinson even got a run out on the right hand side. Um, and I've seen a few comments uh, in the aftermath of that game, actually, from people suggesting that he should be ahead of Stefan Licksteiner in the pecking order. Not sure what you guys think about that. Let me know. Tweet me at Chronicles underscore AFC with your thoughts on Carl Jenkinson and whether or not he should be ahead of Stefan Licksteiner. But as we've come to expect with Arsenal these days, uh, we were unable to keep a clean sheet once again. Uh, Cardiff pulled one back late on through Mendes Lang. Unfortunately for us, there wasn't enough time for them to have a real go, uh, you know, at getting level on the evening after that. So we got away with it a little bit, but poor defending again. Seems to always be the case, doesn't it? And there was a few instances in the first half in particular, a few mix-ups at the back that allowed uh, Cardiff in on goal. And, you know, we were fortunate on the night again um, that they didn't really take their opportunities. And I think the problem with the way we're playing at the moment and, and, you know, I don't want to sound negative, but we're relying on our strikers to be super efficient at the moment, aren't we? Because the amount of chances that we concede um, you know doesn't really stand us in good stead and therefore we have to rely on Aubameyang and Lacazette who I think now if I'm not mistaken have got 30 goals between them this season um, to, to sort of carry us and to pick up points for us of course it's brilliant to have two phenomenal strikers like the ones we do um, but you know we shouldn't ignore the imbalances in the rest of the team and even when Unai Emery looks to play with three defensive midfielders, it still doesn't provide us any form of stability. Um, and, and so, you know, there's, there's got to be something wrong there. Uh, it just doesn't make sense to me. But hey-ho, we won the game. Um, a, a vital three points given that we do travel to Manchester City this weekend. And at the time of recording, Chelsea have just been hammered down at Bournemouth, meaning that we are now in fourth place. Um, due to their goal difference taking a real beating uh, down at the Vitality Stadium. So, you know, when you, you think about our overall objectives this season, which would have been to make the top four, we're in touching distance of that. And in fact, we're in fourth place at the moment. So, you know, in terms of where we are against where we want to be uh, come the end of the season, we're almost there. Um, well, we are there at the minute. Um, but, you know, there's a long way to go and, and things do need to improve, particularly defensively, if we're going to sustain this challenge for Champions League football. And that's my only concern. But, you know, this is not the time to be miserable, not the time to be negative. We're, we're going um, to Manchester City, you know, and, and they've got beat this week as well, uh, midweek at the hands of, of Newcastle United. So they may well be feeling sorry for themselves um, after that defeat, a defeat that really, really did damage their title aspirations um but yeah no point in feeling down I mean we played against a team this evening who had far more reason to uh, be distracted than us far more reason to be down about things the disappearance of Emiliano Salah is something that's really hit the world of football hard <laughs> The arrival of Denis Suarez to Arsenal on loan from Barcelona is imminent. Um, the reports are that it's a done deal already. And at Barcelona, I think in error yesterday, posted something on, on their website that they maybe shouldn't have. They let the cat out of the bag a little bit early. But it looks as though the Denis Suarez to Arsenal deal is done. It will be a loan for the rest of the season with the option to buy him at the end of this current campaign. Um, and I think... That was the sticking point and why it's taken so long. Barcelona initially wanted it to be, um, you know, a, 
a definite that we were going to buy him. They wanted a, a clause in there that we had to to cough up and pay up come the end of the season. Arsenal look to have got their way in the end. Uh, but what will Denis Suarez bring to Arsenal? That is the question. Now, Denis Suarez uh, traditionally has played sort of as an attacking midfield player in the centre of the park. Arsenal fans have been screaming out for, for a winger to come in. And Denis Suarez doesn't really fit that bill. I mean, we've been linked with Ivan Perisic and Yannick Carrasco as well, two other players who certainly would uh, give us options in the wide areas. But interestingly, when Unai Emery was asked a few weeks back about Denis Suarez and how he uh, deployed him during his time at Sevilla, he did say that Denis Suarez had played on the flank for him. So he's a player that Emery knows can do that job. Um, you know, he could also be a long-term replacement for Aaron Ramsey or Mesa Ozil if, uh, you know, his future lays away from the Emirates Stadium. So I think it's a decent signing. I think it's not the uh, the position we were screaming out for um, in terms of priorities, but you'll never say no to, to bring in in quality, I don't think, anyway. You'll always want to improve the squad and the January transfer window is notoriously a difficult one. We've got got our man we've got a player in who will no doubt add uh, improved quality to the squad so I think we should be positive about it hopefully we can get another deal over the line this is being released on deadline day um, but you know at the time of, of recording this I'm not aware of uh, any other deal being close but you know there is lots of Perisic talk there's lots of Carrasco talk there's lots of Nkunku talk as well the PSG midfielder so fingers crossed that Arsenal can get something else over the line that would be great Now it's time to speak to the first of this week's guests. He's a podcaster and Manchester City Football Club's official vlogger. It's Ian Cheeseman. Ian, welcome to the Chronicles of Aguna. Thank you so much for joining us. How are you doing, mate? I'm very well, thank you, despite uh, last night's defeat. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that was a shock result, wasn't it? That was completely out of the blue. I didn't expect... Uh, Newcastle to get anything and you know the way Rafa Benitez has tended to set up in these big games has always been quite negative and you thought you know at best Newcastle could hold somebody to a draw but I didn't expect that I mean what was your feelings watching that and how was the performance overall because I was obviously at the Arsenal game uh, well uh, as you say it was all about defence from Newcastle's point of view and they did put men behind the ball and I was only talking to a Newcastle supporter before the game who said you know expect us to be very strong defensively because we've got four or five very good centre-backs um, and that has been the way that Rafa set up in fact last season City just about squeaked home 1-0 uh, but Newcastle had chances to equalise and so they were grateful to get the three points it was very much the same format City started very well obviously they scored a goal within the first minute and I suppose there could have been some complacency set in at that point because City had been sweeping teams aside to beat Burton 9-0, Rotherham um, 7-0 and Burnley 5-0. And, and, you know, that's been the pattern of the results recently. And you wonder whether there may have been a bit of complacency as a sort of, here we go again. Now we've brought them down. We'll score as many as we want. And they never seemed to press on their advantage. They had a the free kick that was taken which uh, the referee said he'd told De Bruyne not to take it, which is fair enough. So he's entitled to do that. Um, and as a result of that, a, another goal, a second goal, which might have been enough to have sort of gone away and won that game, never happened. Yeah. And it also meant that De Bruyne was on a booking. And in the second half, when some might argue he should have been booked, he wasn't. And as a result, Pep took him off. And, uh, you know, obviously was was a bit worried he might get sent off. And again, there might be an argument to say that removing De Bruyne at that crucial stage interrupted City. Uh, that's not an excuse. It's just stating facts, really. Yeah. And that, that that might have contributed to uh, to losing. But frankly, there's no excuse. They, they weren't up for it. You could see Newcastle were more up for it. Um, they deserved their victory. Let's, let's be honest about it. I mean, I'm not a... I might be a died in the wall City fan, but I'm not blue blinkered. Yeah. You know, you can see what's in front of you. And uh, the fact is that they took their chances and pressed home their advantage in the second half and City wasted chances and, and never really battled as if their lives depended on it, which is what they've got to do. 
in the terms down the, the, the shirt tails of uh, Liverpool. Yeah, I mean, in terms of the title race overall, though, you know, a lot of people after after the result um, at Newcastle were talking about how the title had already gone to Anfield. And I think that talk is very premature. You know, at the time of recording, Liverpool haven't played Leicester City yet. Um, that is not going to be an easy game just based on the fact that there's so much pressure on them, isn't it? Everybody expects them to go out there and get three points at, at home and, and op- ultimately open up this seven point lead. But it, it, do you think I'm right in saying that people are getting a little bit carried away with Liverpool? There's still a long way to go. And, you know, City have played the best football in this country for ever since Pep Guardiola arrived. I, I don't think there's any question about that. So are people being a bit silly and a bit naive to be writing Manchester City off at this early stage? Uh, that's a tough one to answer because the, the truth is that I talk to a lot of City fans and I'm a, I'm a, a blue myself as well as being a, a journalist, worked for the BBC for 25 years. So I've sort of got a foot in both camps. And so I'm able to be maybe a little bit more dispassionate even though I'm a, a dad in the world blue. And I've got to say that even before last night's defeat, even though it was only a four-point gap, watching the, the way City were playing, which is not as convincing and not as good as it was last season, uh, even though the score lines look great, certainly in the, in the week, against the weaker teams, I've not felt that City have played as well this season as last season. And once Liverpool hit the front, obviously the game against Liverpool, which narrowed it to four points, the gap, you felt might might keep City in the title race, but I think the majority of City fans, privately, they might not want to shout about it, privately think that the title race is over. Um, now, obviously, that can that can have an effect on Liverpool, and there were bigger gaps when City were chasing down the title in 2012. In fact, in 2014 as well, when they overhauled Liverpool right at the death, when uh, Steven Gerrard slipped and Denver Bar scored and all that business, you know, so... It ain't over till the fat lady sings, but given that Arsenal is next, Chelsea's just around the corner, trip to Everton in the meantime, this, it, the game against uh, Newcastle was supposed to be the easiest of the four games that were coming up, and they've already slipped up. So I think psychologically, it feels to me as if City, the players themselves are starting to lose that belief. Uh, and I, and I, I genuinely think Liverpool will win it. Uh, I also, maybe this is speaking out of turn, I don't know, I'm only speaking truthfully, but I get the feeling that around the country, because I talk to a lot of opposition fans as well, that um, actually not many people want Liverpool to win the title. <laughs> um, <laughs> I don't, that's there's for been sure. <laughs> a, there, there's been a lot of goodwill shown towards me and City fans sort of saying, well, you know, uh, hope you lose today against us, but we hope you beat Liverpool to the title. Um, I, I don't know if that's fully reflective or not, but um, I've certainly felt it myself, uh, but it, it just and then there certainly seems to be a, a you know a feeling I have that the media would love Liverpool to win it, um, and obviously there's a, a little bit of an agenda against City as, as being seen as a club that are buying the title with the money that they spent, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So there's all a lot of stuff that's uh, that's going on here, um, but the, the the real bottom line of it is if you take all the politics away from it, I, I do I do think that. Um, that the opportunity to win the title has gone, but I'd love to be proven wrong. <laughs> yeah, I hope you're proven wrong as well, because th- th- there will be nothing worse. The only thing that actually, for me, could be worse than Liverpool winning the title would be for Spurs to win it. Um, but that's not going <laughs> to happen, so we don't have to worry about that. Um, no. But you, you mentioned that Manchester City aren't playing as well as they were last season. Why do you think that is? What's changed? Uh, it's not an easy one to answer. I mean, I, I actually think City's game is based on um, very much the whole 11 being part of it, even though there are star names and everybody knows Aguero's name and when Aguero got off the coach at Newcastle last night, he's always the last one off the coach all of the Newcastle fans were going Aguero, Sergio and all that so he's obviously a star and De Bruyne has uh, made a real name for himself as well, but I don't think that City are dominated by one or two stars who make the team special. I think what they do is they play as a team unit very effectively. And that's what actually makes them special. It's the, it's the sum of all the parts and not just individual parts. So therefore, when that isn't quite at its maximum, which is hard to achieve week in, week out in every game, uh, then suddenly it can all sort of seem to disintegrate a little. 
And that's how it feels to me at the moment. When City are under pressure from the opposition, they're not great defensively. Uh, Vincent Company, who was a magnificent defender, still is when he's fit, but he's, he's infrequently fit, dominated City's defence in, in the, the best times that City had. But now with Stones and Laporte, whilst they have a, a good reputation, Stones plays for England and, and Laporte's an outstanding defender in some ways, uh, neither of them are you know, great leaders uh, or dominate. And City's whole game is basically about keeping possession, dominating possession and limiting the opposition to very few chances that you hopefully can just kick off and snuff out. But when they come under a little bit of pressure consistently, then they're vulnerable. Uh, and I think that's what happened at Leicester. Uh, that's what happened against Crystal Palace with pace as well to, to try and exploit the gaps that leave when they push up field. Um, last night was obviously one of them was a penalty but it was also about the power of Rondon so there are different things about them that, that that are making City not quite as effective as they were last season and obviously went a long time without coming De Bruyne being fit um, and he has been a, a crucial player and I don't believe he's back to his best at all yet um, so I, I think that, you know there are, there are a few di- it's not an easy answer to give yeah. but and I, I think City ultimately are just not what they were last season. I mean, as as Arsenal fans, we've been looking ahead to this game and I don't think there's a sensible Arsenal fan out there that's predicted us to go uh, up to Manchester and come away with all three points. I think we've got plenty of defensive problems of our own. And, you know, as Manchester City fans, you must be licking your lips looking at our defence and looking at the injury problems that we've got at the moment there. Is that the case? Are you confident going into Sunday's game? After what happened last night, I'm not confident about any case, to be honest. <laughs> um, I have to say, and, then I, and I don't say this because I'm, I'm speaking to you, but I've been a huge Arsenal fan over the years. Um, the football, I know this is a controversial topic when it comes to Arsenal fans, but I was a huge fan of Arsene Wenger. Um, I think the type of football that Arsenal played for many years under him was just glorious, and it was the nearest I've seen in the Premier League to the way City are playing at the moment. Um, so I'm a big, big admirer. I think... It feels to me as if Arsenal have just lost a little bit of their X factor at the moment. And I am staggered that Ozil, for all of his perceptions of not his work rate not being great, still not being an automatic starter uh, because he has got a little bit of an X factor uh, You know, when he's, he's playing in a special way. From a City perspective, playing Arsenal is probably quite perfect because I don't think they're going to try and muscle City out of it. I don't think they're going to try and play on the counter-attack. I think they're going to try and match City for the way that they play, or at least that's what I've seen of, of Arsenal in the last uh, few games I watched on TV and when we were down there early in the season and then indeed had that match-up in the League Cup final as well last season, yeah. that Arsenal is still a footballing team who wants to play the right way, and I applaud them for that. Um, but that, that actually, in a way, is the type of team that City, that City like to play against. They don't want to play against a sort of physical counter-attacking uh, teams, you know, Chelsea, they lost at Chelsea. Chelsea, even on their own ground, played a little bit of counter-attacking football against them and, and do play slightly more physical games. So I'd, I'd say that, that that City are desperate now to win, at least the fans are, but whether the players are going to respond from that defeat at Newcastle by being psychologically broken or whether they are going to suddenly come back really showing what they can do, is the hardest thing in the world for me to predict. Yeah, I mean, it, it all depends, doesn't it? Will we see a wounded animal reacting or will we see Manchester City feeling sorry for themselves? Um, just to round up, Ian, in terms of a prediction for Sunday's game, um, I know it's not the easiest of fixtures to predict given what you've just said. Both sides can be unpredictable. Both sides on their day can be fantastic, but equally both can be poor at times as well and, and particularly in the defensive sense so how do you see this one going on Sunday well I'm going to disappoint you straight away by saying that I don't do predictions I've uh, never <laughs> done predictions and I don't believe you can predict the outcome of a game and how foolish would I have looked last night at Newcastle if you'd have been on the phone to me before the game and I'd have said well I expect City to win today I'll go for 2-1 or something and then you lose and then you look a right idiot don't you so I've given up on predicting results <laughs> Um, what I would say, though, is that, um, you know, I, I, I've seen City fans in recent years on the vlog that I do, uh, which people can obviously see on YouTube, etc., uh, becoming very 
very, very confident. And, and I understand why. You know, 100 points last season, all the goals that they score, some great, talented footballers. But they, they more, more or less go to every game expecting that the standard prediction is 3-1. Oh, we'll beat them 3-1 today. Yeah, we'll beat them comfortably. And being an old-school, die-hard City fan who's been watching since, uh, you know, the 70s, uh, and basically, you know, I, I've, been, I've attended well over 2,000. But basically, the last 40 years, I've, I've, I've watched City home and away. So from the depths of the third division to, you know, the, the heights that they achieved last season. Yeah. So being old school, um, I find it very uncomfortable to say, oh, yeah, we'll beat them 5-0, we'll beat them 4-0, we'll, we'll cruise past them. I can remember the, the days when it was us that were on the other end of those score lines, and Arsenal were very much a, a bogey team for City and going to Highbury and coming, coming down to the Emirates. Until recent years, our record down there was terrible. I know this game's at the Etihad, but Arsenal have also come and give City a good idea at, at, at home on many occasions as well. And I have a great deal of respect for Arsenal. So I, I'm certainly not going to predict it. I'm hoping it'll be a very entertaining game because of the fact that both teams play, in my opinion, the best football in the Premier League. Um, and from a City perspective, obviously, I'm going to say I hope City will win. Um, but I'll be um, fascinated to see how they react to, to what's happened and... Uh, and, and what I would say, without any reservation, is that I, I wish Arsenal all the best for the rest of the season because I, I, I think they're a, they're a great club. Thank you very much. And, and we wish you the same. If it means Liverpool don't win the league and you know, you've know you managed to topple Manchester United, which is always great from our point of view, given the rivalry we've had with them over the years, I think you know I hate them as much as I hate Spurs, which I think most Arsenal fans would probably agree with that. Um Thank you so much, Ian, for joining me. I know you're really, really busy, so I really do appreciate it. Do you want to just let our listeners know how they can find your vlogs, how they can follow you on social media and keep up with all the brilliant work that you're doing? Well, thanks for those kind words. I mean, the simplest thing is to follow me on Twitter, which is at Ian Cheeseman. So that's dead easy, isn't it? As it sounds, Cheeseman, at Ian Cheeseman, no dots or anything. And I, I tweet out links to everything that I do on there. Uh, but I have a YouTube account which is called Ian Cheeseman Forever Blue. Uh, and I do a match day vlog at every single game. At the moment, I'm the official Manchester City vlogger, which means that for Premier League games, like last night, uh, my YouTube-style vlog goes on their website uh, 48 hours later. Fantastic. It still appears on my YouTube account, but it uh, starts there. And I also have a podcast, the City Podcast, uh, which is a weekly podcast which you'll find on SoundCloud, and it's also called Ian Cheeseman Forever Blue. So there you go, loads of ways you can uh, follow me. But I, I don't suppose many Arsenal fans will want to do that. <laughs> fantastic, fantastic stuff. We'll, we'll want to watch the vlogs when you beat United, when you beat Liverpool, and when you beat Spurs. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good. Well, hopefully we can do that. <laughs> Lovely. Ian, thank you so much. No problem. That was the brilliant Ian Cheeseman. You can find details of how to follow Ian um, and his podcast and his vlog in the description below. Uh, so do check him out. My next guest is John Sperling, an Arsenal author and writer. Here's how that chat went. Joining me on the line now is John Sperling. John, welcome to the Chronicles of Aguna. It's your debut and it's an absolute pleasure to have you with us. How are you? Thank you very much. Yeah, I'm good. I'm uh, enjoying the chilly weather, but it's, uh, yeah, all good, thanks. <laughs> yeah, it is a bit cold, isn't it? Um, yeah. Certainly was at the, the game. <laughs> certainly was at the game on Tuesday night, that's for sure. <laughs> that's right, it was, yeah. <laughs> so, John, as it is your first time on the Chronicles of Aguna, just I want to gauge from you, first of all, how you think this team is doing under Unai Emery. Have you seen progress? Have you been happy with what you've seen so far? Or are you kind of a bit like me and, and still on the fence about it all? I am still <clears throat> very much on the fence about it all. I mean, I think the managerial change, it was the right time to make the change in the summer. I think that um, in an ideal world, I think Wenger would have stood down after the FA Cup final win against Chelsea in 2017. But the change happened. And even when they were in the midst of that long, long winning run, I still wasn't 100% convinced that the old issues had been had been solved. Um, I thought I thought there was a lot more fight in the team. We saw that with the four two win over Tottenham, mm -hmm. and actually, in fairness, you know, last weekend against Chelsea as well, you can see that. 
But for me, um, being a, a 48-year-old Arsenal fan, I was I was brought up on the strength of Arsenal being about defence. Yeah. And I hate to say it, but really the defensive issues haven't been resolved one bit. Um, I think it's the fact that Emery will need at least two, probably three transfer windows to sort it. But as with any defence, it's not just about buying and recruitment. I mean, it is to do with that, but it's a lot about coaching and drilling. Yeah. Um, and I don't see any evidence really that we are we're resolved in in that in that area. I mean, I think linked to it is the fact that <clears throat> Torreira is doing a lot of groundwork in midfield in terms of shielding of the defence. But the more and more I've seen him recently, it's he's doing it more or less alone. And therefore, we are exposed in a lot of ways. So, I don't think a lot of the issues have been resolved in terms of in terms of defence. To be honest, no. Yeah, I completely agree. And and I take your point on board about Unai Emery needing two or three transfer windows. One of the things I've said repeatedly on the show of late is that what's the point in giving him these transfer windows if the club can't go out and sign anybody? And you know, we, we're hearing today at the time of recording that the Denis Suarez deal. It is done um, and yeah. it's going to be announced tomorrow. Um, but in terms of the business that we've done in this window, that, that's not really enough, is it? It's not really going to address the issues that we currently have. No, no, absolutely not. I mean, there was a, the injury to Bellerin is obviously a long-term injury, nine months out. You know, we saw Socrates go down injured last weekend, Koscielny uh, as well. There's a lot of instability in central defence and, and you're right I mean again going back to the George Graham era I was, I was always brought up on, on the fact you could never have enough quality central defenders in, in the squad and arguably we haven't really got any who are who are robust enough and this is what I think it goes back to the transfer windows I think that looking ahead I think Meza Ozil could well will go in the summer um, and from what we hear there will be extra funds, or there will be funds available in the summer, and they have to make central defence a, a, uh, a an absolute an absolute priority. The problem is on Stan, on Stan Kroenke's watch. I do believe that money will always be an issue at Arsenal, um, and and that's why it's so important, I think, to get Champions League qualification back um, via the Europa League. But that is a that's going to be a tall order, looking at how the season's mapping out at the moment. Absolutely. And and John, what have you made of the recent performances? Because we had that really disappointing result at West Ham. We then um, done a number on Chelsea and then Manchester United came to the Emirates and spoiled the party. The win against Cardiff on Tuesday night wasn't the most convincing of wins, but do you share my sentiment in that three points is all that really matters? <laughs> yeah, I, I guess so. I mean, I thought, I thought against Chelsea, I thought the passion and the the uh, relentless closing down, which we saw against Tottenham, was was back. And then it was gone again um, against Manchester United. I know there was a disruption with the injuries, but this Arsenal team is is very inconsistent and still quite frail um, in 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 many ways. And it's hard to see. It, it, I think for me, it's very very difficult to see the team getting top four, if I'm honest with you. I mean, I did a, a pre-season um, piece for when Saturday comes, and my prediction was that Arsenal would finish sixth and have a very, very good run in Europe. And I I hate to say it, but I still stick by that. I mean, I'd love to think they could get top four, but it would mean that Manchester United run would have to come to an abrupt halt and Tottenham and Chelsea would have to seriously bomb. I just don't see it, personally. Um but I do think it would. It was always going to take Emery two or three transfer windows before we can really um, ascertain as to whether he's moved the club forward or not. Yeah, and I mean, John, you've touched on Messi Özil and that you think he'll leave at the end of the season. What have you made of this whole scenario? Because we haven't had you on before, and I'm interested to hear your views on the sort of standoff between him and Unai Emery. For me, it's all a little bit confusing. You know, one week he's not good enough to play, the next week he's the skipper. So, yeah. I mean, how do you see that whole situation? What are your thoughts on it? I mean, I lo- I personally, I love him, Meza Ozil. I mean, I think he is absolutely a class act. But I do take the point that, unfortunately, on, on big occasions, he-, he hasn't delivered. I think Emery's trying to um, stamp his authority with Ozil in terms of he's saying you're not consistent enough, you're not robust enough to get to get a regular start. 
but then he doesn't want to lose his input entirely because I think he does need him um, in the rest of the, of the season to add options to the team. Therefore, he'll make him captain, you know, like he did last, last night against Cardiff and uh, I seem to recall from memory against Burnley as well. That's so right, yeah. I think all the, 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 the messages that Ozil was going to go in the summer, but obviously... Arsenal need to recoup them to get some to get some serious money for him because as we know Arsenal are the worst sellers in football. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so absolutely. They really need to if they're going to sell Özil, they need a wedge for him. Which let's face it, they haven't had a wedge for a decent, honest wedge for a player in a in a long time. Arsenal are not notoriously known for for selling their players well, probably because all the players are <clears throat> on are on a huge salary, um, which. You could argue they don't always justify some of the players they've sold in the last two or three years. So I think he's trying to keep Ozil's confidence up in order to sell him in the summer. I would be amazed if Ozil was at Arsenal next season. And I guess if they can sell him with other funds by or, or re-stabilise or reboot their defence, I guess that the, the ends justify the means. But again, time will, time will tell with that. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, John, this is the preview show, so let's turn our attention to the Manchester City game coming up at the weekend. Yeah. How do you think Manchester City will react to, obviously, the defeat that they suffered on Tuesday night? Are we going to see a wounded animal, uh, you know, looking for revenge? Or are we going to see a team feeling sorry for themselves and licking their own wounds? Do Arsenal have a chance of going there and getting anything in your eyes? Well... Interestingly, when when I saw the game last night, Arsenal Cardiff, I thought, how on earth is this team going to go um, to the Etihad and get anything? And then, of course, you know, Newcastle sprang that side. So all things being equal, you'd expect Manchester City to come back fighting, and I'm sure Guardiola will be working with them on the training pitch to to do that. But um, in football, you you never know if Arsenal can actually go there and harry and hassle in the way that they have done on occasions this season against the likes of Tottenham and uh, and Chelsea uh, at home, you know, they could get something out of the game. We've seen at Christmas that, you know, Crystal Palace, for instance, took the game to City at the Etihad and won. It's not, it's not impossible. And, you know, I, th- I think the Arsenal players need to think like that. I think you'd make Manchester, Manchester City favourites. But City aren't infallible. And I think Arsenal need to play in that hassling, harrowing way. And, you know, you never know. Yeah, absolutely. What about prediction then, John? Stick your neck out on the line and give us a prediction for, for Sunday's game. I will. All right, then. I will be positive and I'll go for a gritty, gutsy 1-1 draw where Arsenal ride their luck and cling on for dear life. Brilliant. How about Brilliant. that? Fingers one, crossed one. you're right. Fingers crossed you're right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, John, it's been an absolute pleasure speaking to you. Do you want to let our listeners know how they can follow you on social media, how they can keep up with your work and, and what you're currently doing at the minute? Yeah, sure. So I'm on Twitter. At, um, it's at John Sperling one. Um, and I write uh, at the moment, what I'm doing is I write um, a historical piece for the Arsenal program for every home game. So it's um, um, 19 moments that, uh, that define Arsenal's 100 consecutive years in the in the top flight. Wow. All right, for when Saturday comes and anyone who basically um, commission my work, so you can follow me there. Um, and you know my my hybrid books and my Rebels for the Cause books are still on Amazon and, and are available. Um, if uh, if you know you've got a birthday or something like that coming up. Fantastic stuff. I'll definitely be checking those out and I'll be having a look for those uh, match day program articles for sure because I'm not going to lie, recently I've been buying the programs and not really going through them in as much detail as I used to, probably because there's so many adverts in them these days. But <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> there's, still, there's still the odd historical historical bit in there. So uh, we've got, yeah, I've done, a, done quite a lot on sort of the 1930s recently. I did Brilliant. some stuff on the, on the, on the run to the 1979 FA Cup final, it being against Manchester United in 79 for the, for the, for the programme last week. They, they're good bits to, good things to, good things to write, yeah. Definitely. I'll definitely be looking out for those. And uh, hopefully some of our listeners will check those out too. John, thank you so much. And hopefully we can speak again in the near future. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Harry. Appreciate it. Cheers.
Right, we're coming towards the end of the show, which means it's time for me to give you my Loser Pool picks of the week. Loser Pool are our sponsors. If you haven't already, please head over to their website, www.loserpool.com. Check them out. It's a fantastic new betting game uh, where they've basically turned betting on its head. Instead of betting on the winner, you're betting on the loser, and it's really, really good fun. Brilliant cash prizes to be won too. Uh, so looking at this weekend's fixtures... Um, I'm going to give you two picks, and I guess the one that probably stands out to me uh, is Huddersfield Town, who travelled to Stamford Bridge, um, you know, given the current form. Well, I was going to say the current form of the two teams, but Chelsea got thrashed at Bournemouth. But even despite that result, you know, Huddersfield have had a dire, dire season, and I don't expect them uh, to get many points between now and the end of the season. So Huddersfield, I think, is a solid pick this week if, you, if you're looking for a guaranteed loser. Um, the other one will probably be Newcastle United, who who go to Wembley Stadium. Spurs managed to get a late victory at home to Watford last night. Um, you know, despite having a lot of players missing, they managed to grind their way through it and get all three points. So, you know, I know Newcastle have brought in a couple of players. I know they've just beaten Manchester City, but they're away form doesn't fill me with confidence. So my two picks this week are Huddersfield Town and Newcastle United. And that brings us to the end of this week's preview show. A massive thank you to every single one of you who's tuned in. Thank you to Ian Cheeseman and John Sperling, my guests this week. Thank you to our sponsors, Loser Paul. If you haven't already, be sure to subscribe via iTunes, via YouTube, or on whichever platform it is that you're listening from. We really, really do appreciate it. If you haven't left us a review, please do. And if you're watching on YouTube, make sure you smash that like button. We'll be back on Tuesday to reflect on the uh, Manchester City game and I suspect that we'll probably be looking back at a defeat as sad as it is to say I don't want to be negative but just being realistic until then take care